This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. start out with just a couple of general questions about sort of what it is you do. Um, a lot of the human rights cases that you've argued have been based on a statute called the Alien Tort Statute, which is a really old statute, comes from 1789, allows aliens to sue in federal court for violations of the law of nations. Uh, a lot of those cases have involved really terrible things, torture, summary execution, disappearance of slavery, uh, forced labor, other horrible things, most of which have happened somewhere else, right? Uh, Argentina, Ethiopia, Mexico, Nigeria, wherever, but not here. So how is it that U.S. federal courts get to consider cases that um, involve non-U.S. citizens for stuff that happened outside the U.S. As a policy matter, isn't it bound to create all kinds of diplomatic and other problems to have this statute there? Why should we have such a thing? Well, the enforcement of international law sometimes creates problems. And the founders understood that. Um, the founders decided in 1789, which is where, when the statute was passed, um, that the lower federal courts, which they were creating in the same statute, uh, would have the power to decide cases brought by aliens for violations of the law of nations. And they understood that that might cause problems, but the litigation of those cases might also solve problems because the nation was committed to resolving issues of international law under the rule of law. What's happened in, recently in the last 35 years is that as the international law of human rights has become um, more codified, um, more accepted by the international community, we have this statute that authorizes the courts to enforce the law of nations. And so we've used it to enforce the law of nations as that law is today. And that includes human rights claims, and they might cause some problems mm. in some cases. So that those are dealt with by other doctrines. Uh, but it also is a fundamental commitment that the founders made to open up our courts for the resolution of these cases, and in the case of human rights victims, to give them a forum where they can vindicate their rights. So are we the only ones that do this? I mean, one of, the, one of the critiques that you hear about the Alien Tort Statute is that the U.S. is an outlier on this. We're the only ones that have a statute that looks like this. Um, do other places do stuff like this? Well, other countries do it in different ways. I think the, the civil law system provides for these kinds of cases, but they do it with action, civil, um, other kinds of mechanisms for enforcing rights. Uh, in the English common law system, usually these kinds of cases are brought as common law tort cases. They're the same kinds of cases, mm -hmm. but they're brought using that system. So we're really not an outlier. It's just this is the way our history and our legal system works um, to vindicate rights. So there's nothing different about what we do than what other people do. Well, we just do it through a different mechanism. We, I don't know if there's nothing different, uh -huh. but there are differences, of course, in every legal system. Mm -hmm. But I think the common thread is for the vindication of rights through whatever system exists. So have you seen, I mean, you've been doing this for a while now. So have you seen an increase in the number of these kinds of cases around the world, not just in the U.S., I mean, looking at this as a global phenomenon, can we talk about some kind of justice cascade or some kind of situation in which there are more and more of these cases that use national courts to try and vindicate human rights? 
Are you are you seeing that in in? Well, your I think that if you include mm -hmm. the international criminal justice system, you clearly would say that because yeah. you have an international criminal court, you have various other international tribunals for the vindication of international human rights, and I think you have an increasing use of the courts um, in the civil context um, to vindicate rights. So I think that you know people have said there's a justice cascade. Um, uh, it's somewhere between a, a very strong trickle and a cascade. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think we'd still like to have a cascade. Uh -huh. um, but it certainly has increased every year since I've been doing mm -hmm. this work. And, and it's increasing at an even more rapid rate as the international human rights movement grows, as there are more non-governmental organizations that help to represent the victims of human rights viol violations. And as, as the victims of human rights violations understand that there are mechanisms where they can vindicate their rights. So talk a little bit about how you got into this. I mean, how did how does a civil rights lawyer... <laughs> how does a boy from the Bronx... Yeah, how does a boy from the Bronx end up doing this kind of work? <laughs> how, did, how did you start Well, I mean, I, I got started being interested in this kind of work mainly from a family connection in that mm -hmm. at least one part of my family perished in the Holocaust. And I grew up with relatives that, that talked about the people that did not survive the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And so that, that left a fairly strong impression on me um, growing up. And then growing up in New York City, going to school in Harlem, I got involved in domestic civil rights issues and, and concerns and, and concern for people that didn't have voices, whether they were domestic or International. Then I, I went to graduate school in England at a time when Idi Amin was killing his opponents, and my my tutor at London School of Economics was someone who had just escaped from hmm. Uganda, and so we spent most of that year uh, working on human rights issues relating to Uganda. And I got to to start my work with Amnesty International back in those days, uh, and so I've always had this kind of com combined interest in domestic and international human rights litigation. And I started teaching international human rights during the semester that Philartica came down. Ah. Um, and, I, and when Philartica came down, I, I looked at that and said, well, this, this is something that can be used to vindicate people's rights. It's a roadmap to how you do it. Um, it's well, that was the first sort of modern ATS case, right? Right, uh, it was. Um, I mean, there were cases there were cases before Florida that tried to use international human rights law. Mm -hmm. uh, I was legal director of the ACLU of Southern California. My predecessor uh, was involved in the Seifuji versus State of California case where he attempted to use the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to end you know, apartheid in America. In those days, it was the alien land law, but it, there were broader implications for the use of the UN Charter. and. Um, the Universal Declaration. And, and he did that for the same reason I was doing it. He, he saw people whose rights needed to be vindicated, and he saw tools with which to vindicate them. And so he tried to use them. And so you were teaching when Philartica came down, and so how did you move from teaching about this stuff to actually litigating these cases? Well, uh, there were cases that happened. Um, that's sort of the way that a lot of my work works. The mm -hmm. General Suarez Mason was found here in Foster City, not far from San Francisco. He was one of the main architects of the Dirty War. And so people brought cases against him. Um, in my case, Juan Mendez, who many of us know, the well-known human rights activist from Argentina, his people he had been imprisoned with disappeared. And their wives became my clients. Um, in a case against Suarez Mason here. And then, of course, when, when Ferdinand Marcos was delivered to Hawaii, that was too great an invitation to, <laughs> to, uh, yeah. to miss. And so we sued Ferdinand Marcos and, and went off on a case that's still being litigated today, which we filed in 1986. Wow. Um, and, and a lot of the cases came up the same way. I, people started to, to find out about the alien tort statute. Mm -hmm. Um, and when they found perpetrators here in the United States, I would be one of the people that they would come to. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the stories that people have about the violations they've suffered, it's pretty hard to say no. Yeah. Well, let me 
ask you another question about the alien tort statute generally, and then I want to kind of talk about specific cases. But one of the things that's always seemed amazing to me is the sort of serendipity of the fact that people walk down the street and they see their torturer in the same town. I wonder if you have any thoughts about how does that happen over and over and over again, that you know people end up, is it because there's so many people who have both fled and who are sort of, you know, human rights violators who kind of want to come and live in the U.S.? Is that what's doing it? Why does this keep happening? It's just... You know, it's hard to tell. I mean, yeah. uh, there have been so many serendipitous occasions. But, you know, there are a lot of domestic cases that happen that way, too. Mm -hmm. and I did a case on police surveillance, uh, um, police political spying, where someone just saw a guy who th she thought was someone that was working in her political organization in a police uniform. Hmm. Turned out he was an undercover agent and it had, and he had you know, wormed his way into the organization. And that's how the case started. It became a big case. Wow. So it's not, it doesn't only happen in this, but it is somewhat surprising, for example, in a case uh, that I did in Georgia where a, a woman who had been tortured in Ethiopia you know, 10 years before found her torturer working as a bellhop in the same hotel. Yeah. I mean, that's, you yeah. know, yeah. what are, what the, are odds the odds of that? Of that? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And yet there it is. It happened. Though. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about the specific cases, but first I want to ask you sort of a general question about litigating these cases. You've talked about and you've written about something called the blank stare phenomenon, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, talk a little bit about that and, and then sort of has it changed? What do you mean by that? And, you know, are you seeing it change or is it still the same kind of blank stare? I, when I wrote that, it was, mm -hmm. it was mainly in response to the Arizona Sanctuary case where we were representing um, 16 defendants who were being prosecuted by the United States for bringing in Salvadoran and Guatemalan refugees during the sanctuary movement. And we brought a motion to dismiss the case based on international law, which I argued in front of a district judge in Phoenix, Arizona. And the judge let me argue for an hour. Um, but it became clear to me after about the first five minutes that he was thinking about something else, like <laughs> whether he had a dinner engagement or, you know, uh -huh. there just was, he wasn't thinking about what I was talking about. And, and it was clear that I would use words that just didn't connect, like, you know, customary law or, yeah. you know, some, or treaty or <laughs> something like that. Um, and, and, and I have encountered that on a number of occasions yeah. where judges have been very polite to me when I make these arguments, but it's absolutely clear that they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and so that's what I wrote. And I, and I think the Alien Tort Statute actually, one of the advantages of the Alien Tort Statute cases is that because Congress passed this statute, judges really pay attention to it, and they know they have to wrestle with mm -hmm. the international law and the doctrine. I think it's actually performed a task of of educating the American judiciary about international law in ways that other kinds of cases have not, mm. uh, because they have to come to grips with a case where Congress has said. But Congress didn't say very much is the problem. Well, they didn't, but Congress doesn't always say a lot. Yeah. You know, the, if you look at the, the, US main, the main US Civil Rights Statute, Section 1983, mm. very few cases from mm. the 1870s to the 1960s. It was virtually hardly used. Mm -hmm. uh, and then starting in 1963, uh, all of a sudden it was discovered as the main arm to enforce mm -hmm. civil rights because the country caught up to where mm -hmm. the statute was. And, and I, think, I think of the ATS a lot in that, in that way, that the founders actually had respect for the enforcement of the law of nations. They didn't know about human rights, mm -hmm. and, and it was a different law of, a law of nations, but they had great respect for doing that. And I think that the enforcement of the law of nations through the alien tort statute today is very faithful to the original uh, purpose of that statute. And the purpose in part being a commitment by the United States to enforce its international obligations. And are you seeing judges now be easier with that concept, or are you still getting, you know, counselor, what exactly are you taught? I mean, nobody actually says it, but are you getting that sort of? Well, Justice Kennedy in uh, the Oval One did ask me why I was there. 
<laughs> as I recall, <laughs> within about the first 15 seconds. Um, so I mean, I think there's still, there's still some judicial skepticism. Uh -huh. Going back to your first question, there's still yeah. judicial skepticism about the appropriate role of US courts in enforcing these cases. And there are some important questions relating to that. You know, should we be enforcing the law of international human rights on behalf of Nigerian villagers against a British company and a Dutch company? I mean, that's a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. And there's, there are answers to that. Uh, but one answer also is that as other countries enforce those rights, as, for example, the Dutch courts have begun to do, mm -hmm. even while Kiobel's been pending, yeah. um, it's much better, it seems to me, for courts around the world to be doing this and not just U.S. courts or not primarily U.S. courts. I think we're looking for a system where, where anywhere you go, Internet mm -hmm. human rights can be enforced by the courts mm -hmm. by national courts. by national courts yeah. yeah, so that you're not just relying on a couple of places right. or even on international courts, right? Yeah, I mean, I think when the ATS really does become truly exceptional and mm -hmm. and the the rule is that you take these court cases to National courts and vindicate your rights then we will have succeeded. Yeah, yeah Let me turn to Kyobel because I know a lot of people want to hear what you think. So this is the last case. Um, and as you say, this is a well, I don't know. I mean, they might want me to re-argue it again. <laughs> and once a year, whether you like to it. or not, right? <laughs> um, so Dutch company, British company, uh, on behalf of um, Dr. Kiobel and 11 other villagers from the Agoni area of right. the Niger Delta. Right. Crimes against humanity, torture, extrajudicial executions, as have so many other cases. Right. Talk a little bit about what the issues are in Kyobel and talk, I'm especially interested in what's your take on why the re-argument? Why after, you know, 13, 35 years after Falartiga, uh, which is a case involving people in Paraguay uh, after you know, dozens of ATS cases, all of a sudden we're back talking about whether the ATS can apply to conduct that happened outside the U.S. But talk about both sides of it a little bit. Well, there's a lot of questions. I know, there's a lot of questions. You can give <laughs> oh. a lot of answers. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, well, where to start? Uh, what happened in, in Kiobel, um, in terms of how it got up to the court at least, yeah. was there were two cases. There was Wewa versus Shell also on behalf of some other Nigerian plaintiffs. Um, that case wound up settling in June of 2009 for $15.5 million. Um, at, at the same time, because Kiobel had been filed slightly later than that other case, um, there was a new motion to dismiss, and the same judge denied it as she had denied the motion in WeWa. Um, but she decided, for reasons known only to her, to certify the question of whether those norms that you mentioned were actionable under the Alien Tort Statute, whether you could bring claims for crimes against humanity, extrajudicial mm -hmm. execution, torture, and the like, after Sosa versus Alvarez machine which was the Supreme Court case in 2004 that was the first case they had decided and where after Sosa all the defendants and all the ATS cases tried to bring motions to dismiss again based on what they thought Sosa meant. So this went up on those issues. Um, at the oral argument in the Second Circuit, Judge Cabranes raised in another case that was also being argued the question of whether a corporation could be sued um, uh, under the Alien Tort Statute, whether there was a norm of customary, of, of uh, corporate liability in international law. That was, she was never been raised in Kiobo, uh, and we didn't argue it in Kiobo. So we waited. The other case came down and didn't decide that issue. And then a year and a half later, the same panel decided by a two to one vote that you couldn't sue corporations under the Alien Tort Statute, using an analysis that was really at odds, in my opinion, with almost everything that had been written before under the Alien Tort Statute. 
And so that's what caused us to go up to the Supreme Court. We filed the petition for cert mm -hmm. to overturn that. At the first argument, which is that's the issue we thought we were arguing. Um, <laughs> and that's when, in the very beginning of the argument, um, Justice Kennedy changed the subject to whether a case like this should be in U.S. courts at all because mm -hmm. the, the corporations were foreign corporations and the plaintiffs were, were not U.S. citizens. Um, and, and so that's, mm -hmm. they reformulated the question of the, what circumstances could you bring a case where um, the events took place on foreign sovereign territory. So do you think Justice Kennedy was bothered by the nationality of the defendants? In, in other words, was it the Dutch-British problem that was bothering them? Possible. Um, I think one of the questions was why, why in his mind, I, I, if I could try hard to... Hard to put yourself in Justice Kennedy. To do that, but I mean, it, it, yeah. it seems that what the, the concern was is why should a U.S. court be sitting in judgment over a Dutch corporation and a, or an English corporation for things that their subsidiary did in Nigeria to Nigerian villagers who don't really have a connection to the United States. And I don't think he focused on the fact that the Nigerians in question all were residents of the United States yeah. and actually had been driven to the United States to get asylum by the human rights violations that we were complaining about in the case. I don't think that was a focus of his attention because it really wasn't part of the, the record at that point hmm. um, because we were litigating a different issue. Um, and, and so I, I took the re-argument as meaning that they wanted to resolve a number of sort of overarching issues about the circumstances in which you could sue corporations under the Alien Tort Statute and were allowing broad briefing on those issues and then they were going to try to resolve that in some way. Let me go back to Sosa for a second. Sure. Sosa is the first case that the Supreme Court takes on the ATS, right? right? Um, and Sosa basically seems to approve of the use of the ATS, but with a whole series of cautions and caveats. And here, are, it, it's a very strangely structured opinion, right? Because it, it basically says, here are all the reasons why we think you know, this should not be shut down. Right. But then here are all the reasons why we're a little worried. And so here's why we think you should sh be shut, not be shut down, but we're worried. Right. Right. The worries are mostly in the footnotes, though. Yeah. <laughs> so my stuff is in the text. Uh-huh. OK. <laughs> so. That's better, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending so. on <laughs> who you ask. Right. So I want to talk to you. I, I want you to talk a little bit about the, the sort of what do you make of Sosa um, in terms of going forward, right? So, you know, is it that Florida and the whole line of cases that say you can bring these claims is basically ratified, but sort of don't go any further than that? Or is it, as the defendants have argued in a lot of these cases, oh no, Sosa has changed everything, and now you need to walk through this whole analysis of each of the cautions. How do you read what the court actually did in Sosa and how it's going to influence what they can and can't do here in Kiobo? Well, I read Sosa as being more closer to the first statement you made. Okay. Um, and not only because it's in my self-interest to say Business that. As usual. Um, and, and in fact, yeah. I think most courts after Sosa mm -hmm. read it more like that mm -hmm. than, than Sosa has changed everything. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still, because Sosa had all those cautions in it, I think there's still open questions about the limitations. And, and so defendants properly are probing all the limits they can find and the courts have to come to grips with those. I think Kiobel can be viewed in that light, that it's just one. And defendants have been making the extraterritoriality argument for a while now. Yeah. Um, and at some point, presumably, the courts were going to take it up. Now, I actually thought Sosa so actually resolved the extraterritoriality argument. That's what I would have argument. thought, too. I, I mean, but, and so I've always been surprised when defendants have made that argument. Mm -hmm. But, you know. But From a technical standpoint, I suppose there are ways to say that it's not part of the holding, but, huh. 
we were, it was briefed. Um, it was clear that the Sosa was an extraterritorial case. Everything happened in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's always been a mystery to me why, hmm. why that came up again. Talk about the evolution of the corporate cases. I mean, in, in some sense, the problem that the court has to grapple with now has to do with what the rule, where we get the rule from. Right. Do we get the rule from international law or do we get the rule from common law right. Right, as to whether corporations could be sued? Now, that's something that has a long pedigree in the corporate cases. I mean, to what extent you know, was this set up by the evolution of the earlier cases? Kind of going back to Unical, right? going right. back to the, the, the very beginning of these. Right? Talk a little bit about how well, that... Back farther than that. I mean, okay, I think that the issue... I mean, it, Florida left open the issue of where, of what law provided the mm -hmm. cause of action and, and, and the other issues in the mm -hmm. case. Yeah. And so from the beginning of this enterprise, there's been a question about which law applies to what issue, mm -hmm. right? And, and courts have come to different conclusions about that. Um, and in fact, before Sosa, we thought that the cause of action came from the ATS itself. And one of the things Sosa changed was that it became a federal common law cause of action. And so now we have a whole new question is what does that mean and what, with respect to where does the law come from? Now in Doe versus Unical, as you pointed out, I mean, the issue there was the, the, the aiding and abetting definition. Where did you get aiding and abetting from? Was it the international law aiding and abetting or was it federal common law aiding and abetting? Um, and the, the, the Ninth Circuit split on that. Mm -hmm. The panel in Unical, two of them thought it was international law, and one of them thought it was federal common law, and that went up on Bonk, and we argued it once. We're about to argue it the second time after Sosa, and then we settled Doe versus Unical without them having made a decision. Say just a little bit about what that case was about. Well, Doe versus, Doe versus Unical was a case brought on behalf of Burmese villagers who had been subjected to forced labor, torture, and and in one case, extrajudicial execution of a baby um, by the Burmese military in conjunction with Unical, which was then an oil company, has since been purchased by Chevron, um, and Total, the French oil company, in a consortium to bring natural gas from one side of Burma th through a pipeline to the other side of Burma f to take it to market in Thailand. Um, and the, con the, the joint venture used the Burmese military for security on the project as they were destroying villages to make way for the pipeline. Hmm. And that's where all the violations took place. And actually the case came up, at least from my perspective, in the way a lot of the individual cases came up. Um, the, there were human rights groups on the ground that were protesting the project. They tried quiet diplomacy with Unical's board and, and chief executive. They tried naming and shaming. They tried public relations. They tried shareholder resolutions. They wrote a report and tried to stop them, and nothing was stopping the project. So they came to us and said, well, can you sue them? And based on all of the work that had been done in the individual cases, like Marcos and other cases, um, the decision was to try to stop the pilot in those days was actually to try to stop the pipeline by using the ATS and also to get damages for the, for the victims. Um, and so it was a case that was very much driven by the fact there were victims of human rights abuses that wanted some form of redress in the alien tort statute that was available. And the question was, why can't you sue a corporation in the same way you can sue Ferdinand Marcos? Mm. And you know we, our answer was why not? Why not try it? Yeah, yeah. 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 And so I, I want to stick with Unical for just a second. Um, why'd they settle? And <laughs> the extent you can talk about it, what happened with the settlement? I mean, did they actually do what they said they were going to do? Um, like when I talk about, let's see, uh, it is a confidential settlement. Yes. And I would never, of course, violate the terms of that settlement since someone from Munger Tolls or one of the lawyers might be watching this tape. Um, <laughs> um, 
the, the settlement was about money, mm -hmm. which, I mean, ultimately, we, we did not win the injunction to stop mm -hmm. the pipeline. So this, the pipeline was completed by the time the case was settled. Why they settled is not clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not You clear. had some evidence in that case, though, that was Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was a strong yeah. case, I think. And, and there, was a, there was a trial that was scheduled in California, in Los Angeles Superior Court, um, the spring after we settled. So they were facing an en banc hearing in the Ninth Circuit on the issues we were talking about before. And, um, and they were facing a trial in state court on the state court claims when the case was settled. Um, and the, the, the one thing I can say about the settlement is that in addition to money for the particular plaintiffs, um, there was also money that was devoted to other kinds of uses for people in the region. Mm -hmm. And that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's very gratifying that that's happened. I mean, that money's been put to very good uses. And, yeah. and so the people that suffered from mm -hmm. the pipeline project have gotten some benefit from the case, even though it wasn't a class action. And one of the nice things about the cases I've been involved in is that I've had, we've had plaintiffs who have been willing to give up some of their own, mm -hmm. what they might otherwise be entitled to, um, to have a fund or some other kind of thing um, to help people in the community. That was true in Wewa versus Shell, too, where there's a foundation that was set up that would help people in Agoni, other than the plaintiffs. Huh. So these were not class actions, but the plaintiffs right. agreed to do this as right. part of a... They agreed to do it because they, in, in the case of the Burmese mm -hmm. plaintiffs, um, they always understood that they were doing it for the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's why they did it, uh, and that they knew they were speaking for more people than themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the same was true for, for the plaintiffs. Yeah, and, and we yeah it, it's interesting. You know, the, the reason I raised the, the settlement issue is sort of to, for young lawyers starting out, sometimes the idea is, you know, all you're interested in is, is money. And yet, when you talk to a lot of ATS plaintiffs, that's not what they tell you, right. right? You know, or they're not interested in money for themselves. They're interested in uh, other things. So, if it's not money, when you talk to a lot of these ATS plaintiffs, right? They, you know, they're not going to get a lot of money out of this, right? Either the defendant doesn't have assets, or the defendant has hidden the assets. Uh, you can't get at the assets. They're in some Swiss bank account, and the Swiss won't tell you where they are. Right? So if it's all about money, it's not going to work real well. So what is it that people are looking for in these cases? Well, I think they're looking for a lot of different things. I mean, they're looking to be heard. Mm -hmm. They're looking for some form of justice. They're looking for some form of accountability. They want a, either a judge or a jury in th whatever the proceeding is to find that the person that killed their father or tortured their sister or tortured them is, found, is at least stated to have done it, mm -hmm. found to have done it. Um, that, that process, I think, is, is very important for people. Um, that's certainly what, what the people I've represented have said, that, that going through that process has been important for them and that the world knows about that process mm -hmm. is important to them. Some of the plaintiffs have been able to get other forms of assistance through the course of the litigation. They've been put together with people that can give them psychological help. That's happened in a number of cases mm -hmm. where they might not have gone before, but yeah. the process has, has given them the strength to get some of the help that they need to move on with their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that, that some plaintiffs think that being a part of a suit like this is also making them part of a larger human rights movement that's demanding accountability when things like this happen. Um, I think it's, you know, there, there are a lot of different reasons, um, all of them good ones. And I think that they hope that they're part of building a structure that eventually deters the violations. Because mm -hmm. that's really what it's about, right? It's so that they won't happen rather than you get some damages for them afterwards. Talk about the role of the U.S. government in all of this. The, the U.S. has played different roles at different mm -hmm. times with respect to the ATS. Um, in Florida, there was the very famous brief that, that helped create mm -hmm. all of this and say that it was in the U.S.'s interest 
to open for the, our courts as a forum for the vindication of um, the human rights of, of people from outside the United States. Um, that was reaffirmed in the Kadich case by, um, by the Clinton State Department. Of course, during Reagan, the Reagan administration came in against the, the plaintiffs in the Marcos case, but the Ninth Circuit did not adopt its view. And it, it, it's tended to be an ideological football with Democratic administrations filing favorable briefs and Republican administrations filing opposing briefs. I think the Bush administration was notable in uh, filing lots and lots of briefs against the corporate cases. Um, in Kiobo, um, the United States was schizophrenic um, in that the, in Kiobo 1, the US filed a brief on the side of the plaintiff saying that there was corporate liability under the Alien Tort Statute, and then turned around and, and filed a brief um, on behalf of Shell um, on the other question. Um, what, it, what that brief said is still not exactly clear to me. Um, and in the oral argument, it did not seem to be very clear to the justices either, which was a good thing. Um, but clearly, the politically, it became there's, there's debate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, they came in on both sides, um, which was interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Uh -huh. um, in, in terms of suing the the um, the United States, you can't sue the United States under the Alien Tort Statute because when you sue the U.S., you have to sue them under the Federal Tort Claims Act. So the question is, when can you sue the U.S. government officials? Mm -hmm. And generally speaking claims against U.S. government officials gets become claims against the United States so you're under the Federal Tort Claims Act, so you're back where you started from. Yeah. Now, we've made various attempts to get around that. The Sosa case, actually, in Sosa, there was a claim against the United States under the FTCA, and there were originally claims against the U.S. officials that wound up being substituted. There's a whole, th there are other cases now pending based on, on behalf of Guantanamo detainees and, and detainee, detainees in, in Iraq, uh, the Abu Ghraib mm -hmm. situation. Um, and those have not been successful so far. All of them go to the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit is, has not accepted them. And so the mm -hmm. question is whether that will ever change yeah. or whether there needs to be a legislative solution. There's another genre of case, though, that hasn't actually been brought much, which is cases against state or local mm -hmm. officials, which would not be governed by, by uh, the Westfall Act or the FTCA. Uh, I once sued a LAPD, LAPD officers under the Alien Tort Statute. And what? Uh, it depends on how you define winning. <laughs> um, we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't win the Alien Tort Statute <laughs> part of it, but... Um, but I still believe to this day that the Ninth Circuit reversed on the other issues, mm -hmm. in part because of the persuasiveness of the alien tort statute argument. But that's, I'm probably the only person that thinks that. Well, no, but there are. We did win, the, we, did, we, were, we were, uh, won the appeal and we were able to settle the case and our client, uh, w our client won a victory. And so that, that's that so is good. the bottom line uh, yeah. in mm -hmm. the work that we do. Mm -hmm. That's all good. Let me just sort of ask you a little bit more about um, about that. Suits in state court for human rights violations. So you were saying that in Unical, there was a federal court case and then there was a state court case. Right. Why aren't more cases brought in state court? Why not just do these as plain old ordinary torts actions? Well, uh, for the, in, the, in the Unical case, what happened was unusual in that we filed a case in federal court that brought both federal and state claims, which is the usual way mm -hmm. that it's done. And so instead of going to state court, we filed the state court claims with the federal ATS claims in federal court. What happened in Unical, though, is that there was summary judgment granted against us on the ATS claims, which we then appealed. And the judge decided to dismiss the state claims without prejudice to us bringing them in state court. So that's what we did. So yeah, it's kind of. And so we filed the mm -hmm. virtually the same complaint, only we brought it under traditional tort 
theories. You know, torture became battery, mm -hmm. extrajudicial execution became wrongful death, um, and we pursued those claims in state court. And I think that's what would happen if the eighth, if the Supreme Court decides Kiobel in a way that that restricts the ATS quite a bit. Um, we would probably start going back to state court. Uh, is there any reason not to just do that anyway? Not, not to there are some, sort of there are some sort of practical that. reasons. Mm -hmm. One of them is the, the ATS has a 10-year statute of limitations mm -hmm. with fairly favorable equitable tolling mm -hmm. doctrines. Um, in state court, the statutes are usually um, shorter than that. And a lot of times, as a practical matter, you don't get the cases until after the state statute of limitation is, mm -hmm. has passed, in which case the ATS really does become your last resort. Um, so that's one practical thing. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that's, that's, that's more important in a way is that there's just something unsatisfying both to the client and to you about calling torture battery. Yeah. You know, or calling extrajudicial execution wrongful death. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're talking about enforcing international human rights law. We should be enforcing international human rights law and not calling it something else, um, at least in my view. And, and, and part of the reason for the cases, at least for the lawyers, I think, is to develop the international law of human rights and to, to make sure that our courts enforce it. And I think enforcing it as battery doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. So there, there are some other reasons why, in terms of looking at the larger picture of, you know, making your cascade a waterfall of great dimension, um, uh -huh. that we would want to do it the other way. Yeah. Talk a little bit about sort of the most moving things that you've come across in litigating these cases. I mean, the, the, the stories that you've found most compelling uh, over the years. Yeah. There are a lot of them, yeah. actually. But there's one, one of the cases I did, I think, had the most impact on me, which is the, a case called the Baby Jury, jury versus Nagawa. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, there were three Ethiopian women who found their torture in, in Atlanta, Georgia, working as a bellhop. Um, and one of the women lived in Los Angeles, and that's how I got involved in the case. Center for Constitutional Rights originally brought it. Um, and the woman, her, her name is Elizabeth Demisi. Um, and I started interviewing her to start getting ready for trial. Um, and it turned out she had never talked to anybody about what had happened to her. I mean, in any kind of detail. She hadn't told her mother. And in her case, her father had been executed. Her sister, had, who had been tortured the same time as she was, I mean, she was 17, her sister was 16. They were tortured in, a, in this dungeon of a place in Addis uh, where they were stripped and, and hit with wires and hung upside down and with vomit-filled socks in their mouth and mm. all that. And her sister disappeared the next day um, after that. And so and she told stories about her mother and she, when she got out, going to all the body dumps in Ethiopia looking for her sister. Um, so it was a very overwhelming story at an individual level. And we, we had to have that conversation over a period of time to get her ready for this. And then when we went to trial, because Nagawa represented himself at trial, and so he was going to cross-examine the women. So we had to get them ready to, to be cross-examined by the guy they had last seen you know, when they were in that condition. And, and they weren't sure they could do it. And Elizabeth just wasn't sure she could do it. Um, and so getting that whole process of getting ready for that was such an intense experience. And then the trial itself, you know, and I'm sure that anyone who's tried an ATS case with, you know, with the people themselves actually testifying about what's happening. I mean, it's an amazing, overwhelming experience. But this one, to me, I, the way I describe it is that the walls of the court were crying. I mean, everybody was crying. It got through to the judge in ways that were, you know, beyond anything. You know, when I first made my opening statement, he stopped me and said, why are you here? You know, hmm. you know this happened in Ethiopia. These are Ethiopians. You know, the, the way you started the interview basically is the way he started the hmm. case. And, I, and my response to it was Florida and 
Congress says you have to do this, basically. You say, all right, <laughs> go ahead. <You> know? <laughs> but by the end of it, he was completely convinced, I think. He, I mean, he saw in a, for, in, in, in a way that you can't describe, you know, evil. Hmm. Evil in what it did to people. And, you know, and, and Elizabeth, when she was cross-examined, did much better than when she was on direct. I mean, she, she got this incredible strength and dignity. And, and you know, I, I remember she said some, he said something like, you know, you're lying, you know, why would, why would I do this to you? And she looked him in the eye and said, I've been waiting 17 years for you to tell me that. And, and then, you know, she testified about how she decided she would never have children because she would never bring kids into a world like this. And you know, I just, you know, you sort of, that's why we do it, right? I mean, it's, you know that there are millions of people around the world who have had that kind of thing happen to them. And so, you know, if while you're on this earth, you can respond in some way that helps them, there's nothing better you can do as a lawyer. Yeah. So, last thing I want to ask you. So having just said there's nothing better you can do, so we have yet lots of young lawyers who come to law school because they want to do what you do, right? And they, <laughs> right? I have a lot of cases. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go, that's the answer. How do you, you know, as a young lawyer graduating now, what advice would you have for people who really want to do this kind of work? What would you say? Find some way to do it. Find some way to do it. Okay. You know, I mean, for in my what? case, I mean, I don't get paid to do the alien tort statute cases. Mm -hmm. You know, those are labors of love. I mean, I have find I've found some other way to make a living. You know, in my particular case, I do a lot of police abuse cases and traditional civil rights cases, and that's what pays the rent. And you know, the the rest of it is just because I believe in it. Yeah. And so if you want to do it, you find some way to do it. And there are a lot more opportunities now than when I started. I mean, there's all sorts of international human rights jobs where you can make a difference. Um, but I think people should write, they should volunteer, they should do clerkships in the summer, they should find some way to, to become part of the network. And, and there's a tremendous joy in being part of the, this group of people that do this kind of work. I mean, there's a lot of really nice people that you meet. And, um, you know, it's, I think it, it's very fulfilling. I mean, I know when my career is over, I'll look back on it and, and be satisfied that I, that I did the right thing. So I guess where, where I, where I want to end up, um, talk about the movement more, more, more globally. All right, so ATS litigation is a piece. Right. of trying to um, get people to be able to enjoy their human rights. Let's, let's sort of broaden it out even more. Where do you see the human rights movement going more generally? Not so much in terms of litigation, but in mm. terms of how this piece of it fits into a larger movement uh, for, uh, for people's human rights. I know you've spent years working with ACLU, working with Amnesty, working with a lot of different right. groups. So I guess take off the litigator hat for a second and put on the, the, the sort of human rights person hat. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> talk a little bit about where, where you see this movement going. Well, you know, it's, it's, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I see it expanding. I see it growing all the time. Um, I mean, where it's going to go ultimately, I don't know. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of that's going to depend on what younger, where younger people take it, right? Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, people like yeah. my daughter, for example, mm -hmm. you know, who's just starting in the movement, are going to bring it to other places, and maybe they'll accomplish what we've not been able to accomplish. I mean, we'll, we haven't accomplished corporate accountability. You know, we haven't made international environmental law is something that actually works. We haven't mm -hmm. been able to deal with climate change in an effective way. Um, I think those are the directions that the human rights movement are gonna go. I think people are very concerned about the environment and the climate change um, in ways that the traditional human rights movement haven't been in the past but have to. 
Mm. Uh, over the years, the traditional human rights movement has expanded its its uh, its view to women's rights more. Mm. I mean, there were times when I started when that was not a big focus of, of like Amnesty International, for example. They had to fight for LGBT rights within the organization before you even get to fighting, having the organization fight for it outside the organization. I think that's gonna be taken, you know, so many more steps. Um, yeah, I did a lot of uh, LGBT litigation as an ACLU lawyer, and back, particularly back in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And, um, you know, th there's been a sea change in attitude. Um, and I hope that that's going to be taken beyond that. You know, I have a hard time thinking about it anymore, but not as a litigator. Because, <laughs> and it, but the thing that the thing I, I comment about on that though is that one of the things I've always thought as a litigator is that litigators in this field that don't pay attention to the human rights movement are not doing them or their clients a service, because it's, it's so interrelated. If you look at Philardega, Philardega was based on the work that the human rights movement did to make sure that torture was declared to be a violation of international law. I and mean, Florida cites the Declaration Against Torture. How did that happen? I mean, it happened because there was a worldwide campaign against torture that started in the early 1970s, you know, which Amnesty played a major role in. Why did the Convention Against Torture get, get, get go through? Well, in part, it was because Argentina became democratic and votes changed, but it was because there was another campaign against torture. So all of the work that the movement does to create norms, that's what we work with. Right? I mean, that's, those are the tools. We don't have them unless there are people out on the streets or nowadays on Facebook, um, you know, organizing in the way that you organize to, to get people to change their minds. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have, I hope that, that lawyers, the lawyers we're training will, will always remember that and be mm -hmm. part of the movement, uh, support it, but also be part of it. Mm -hmm. And think about different forms. And think about different forms. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, it doesn't matter how you get the success. You have to use whatever tools you get. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is to make sure that the victims of human rights violation, r violations are made whole and that there aren't any new ones made. How you do that, there's all these tools out there. We have to make them effective and, mm. and make them work. Mm. So one thing I hear you saying is the confluence of various different movements. What about human rights and civil rights in this country? Do you see a confluence <laughs> happening there or is that? Eh? Not as much as I had hoped. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'd have to say that I'm very disappointed at the relatively low membership of organizations like Amnesty in the United States. Mm. And I, it's hard for me to explain that. You know, I think there's a resistance in many parts to international law. Mm. It seems exotic to many people. Um, but I, you know, that, that's, that's also one of the tasks of the next generations, I think, is to make, to make it part of and parcel of the political culture of the United States. I think it's a very tough job to do that, but I think a lot of work's been done in that area, and I think that, at least in general, I think there's a sympathy for human rights. I think it has some resonance, but there's so much more work to be done. Yeah, yeah I've always wondered why it is that civil rights lawyers don't think about things in terms of, you know, there's a human right to this. But, but people are thinking about it more. All right. You know, I know when I started at the ACLU, um, they wouldn't even give me a room at the biennial to talk about international human rights. I had mm -hmm. to fight to, you know, to get a room. <laughs> now there's a human rights program in New York where there's lawyers that actually use the international mm -hmm. mechanisms within the ACLU. I mean, so that, that's, a, that's a big change. You know, not a big enough change, but it's a, it's a change. And so, you know, 30 years from now, maybe it'll be, they'll actually be litigating, you know, human rights cases in the Supreme Court or getting, putting people on the street to march. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be good. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, I think we're, we're there. Um, good. Well, thanks. Thank you so fun. much. Um, yeah, it's been fun. So uh, join me in thanking uh, Paul for... Uh,
Thank you so much.